Run of river hydro is a different way of doing it. You basically put a, a turbine in the river and just let it uh, twirl around. Um, and that's beginning to be popular for small installations because it doesn't affect the river floor or fish. But it's not so predictable in large scale as a dam. There's been recent criticism of dams in the tropics um, uh, because flooded vegetation can give off methane uh, in warm climates, uh, which in the worst cases can cause as much global warming as a coal fire plant. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, however, dams in colder climates seem to be okay and the, they can provide valuable, dependable power and control of water for agriculture. The next to develop commercially was wind. The first known electricity uh, generating windmill operated was a battery charging machine installed in 1887 by a Scotsman, James Blythe. And uh, um, the first windmill for, in, for a, as an electricity producer in the United States was a 12 kilowatt machine, which some of you can see in the photo here used by Charles uh, Brush in 1888, not, not much later. The 1880s were uh, obviously a fervent time for technology. Um, in, by the 1930s, hundreds of thousands of small wind generators were being used in the farms in the United States that were off-grid. Much larger machines were <clears throat> subsequently developed to a higher level by the Danes in the 1960s and 1980s, resulting in the three-bladed design uh, common today, which you see in the picture. California incentives of the 80s and 90s established the commercial wind industry, but um, it finally achieved hive growth in the mid-1990s and really took off. Uh, this, uh, this high rate of manufacture uh, uh, has gone on for quite some time, increasing for most of the decade at about 28% per year, which is a phenomenal uh, uh, increased rate. But it also dropped the price of wind generation so that in many places wind is as cheap as fossil fuel per kilowatt hour. Generators are now everywhere in Europe and are spreading rapidly in China. Spain established its wind incentive program around uh, the turn of the century and wind capacity grew eight times in eight years. Spain receives 11% of its annual electricity uh, from wind um, and uh, on one day in two last year, 43% of the electricity in the whole country was supplied by wind. The downside of wind is its unpredictability. Wind is usually limited to about 20% of annual generation uh, because of concerns about grid stability. However, recent analysis has shown that um, if you have a very large uh, group of wind generators over uh, on a continental scale or uh, hundreds of thousands of generators, uh, some of them will be going at any, one, at, one, at any one time. They'll never all be shut down. In other words, um, and that, that has been looked at uh, statistically and it comes to around a minimum of 33%. A third of the generators are going to be going uh, in a large system, and if there is an effective interconnect over the, uh, over the continent, these are available as baseload uh, power for the grid. Wind started its big push in the global market uh, around 1995 and, and grew very quickly, um, but uh, it's starting to slow down and is operating at about 23% per year. Um, but it's going to have to, we're going to have to use wind uh, to succeed in near-term environmental measures because it's low cost and it's ready to go. And I think uh, it will be a great success, it, but it will need partner technologies and the system to provide a, de a dependable service. Now, there's no shortage of wind, I should say. Uh, the economically vi viable wind resources that exist uh, uh, on, land, on land alone, this is not including the resources offshore, are more than four times projected total world energy demand in 2010. The third technology uh, to come, become commercial was solar power, photovoltaic power, or PV. PV converts sunlight directly into DC electricity uh, using semi semiconductor material. In 1839, uh, Alexander in von Becquerel discovered uh, the photoelectric effect where the conductance of metal uh, through an electrolyte increases uh, uh, with illumination. The photoelectric effect was explained by Albert Einstein in 1904, but well before that, in 1877, Charles Fritz in the United States had patented the first selenium solar cell, and it had 1% efficiency. And that, that may seem kind of useless, but in fact, that became the, uh, if, you ever met, if some of you remember the old cameras that we used to have before the digital age, and the little meter that went back and forth uh, in your Spotmatic or whatever, uh, that, that was a selenium solar cell, in fact. And so they were used for over 100 years. 
Bell Labs in 1952, and that's the picture that we just went through, um, demonstrated a solar cell which became a prototype for those used in space, and then uh, we see here uh, one being installed on a satellite prior to launch. Uh, by 1983, uh, the sales were $250 million a year, and PV started to get large-scale market traction about 2005, about 10 years after wind. And now it's going up uh, pretty much like a rocket. Between 2006 and 2008, the industry was growing at the rate of 50% per year. So it's very staggering. Um, um, but, uh, and this year, uh, a single project of 2,000 megawatts, 2,000 megawatts uh, has been announced in China using American technology, uh, low-cost low for solar uh, technology based on cadmium telluride. The size of that array is bigger than Manhattan. So uh, solar is actually transitioning. This is, this is the biggest solar plant in the world. PV has been dependent on uh, very high upfront subsidies in country, com, com, uh, countries like Germany and Spain, but the recent economic downturn caused Spain to cut back these subsidies sharply, and the panel prices immediately dropped by about 50%. Uh, uh, and uh, this, this may mean, you may think that they're making excessive profit. No, actually now they're making losses. Uh, but they, they have uh, uh, a lot of panels uh, in storage and they want to get, want to get rid of them. The, the recent solar systems difficulties in uh, Victoria and the failure of OptiSolar in California, uh, or, or no, it wasn't California, but the United States, uh, show that the recession has hurt the PV industry. But uh, low-cost Chinese manufacturers like SunTech are still operating at a profit, according to that company. And, um, uh, and that work is uh, an offshoot of, uh, that has an Australian background, it's the offshoot of work done at the uh, University of New South Wales in the PV group. Um, First Solar, that other big company, uh, continues to sell strongly into the market, even in this uh, climate, and, uh, and now has a stock market valuation um, Still, still in the recession in the United States of $13 billion. So it's, it's basically starting to do a Google. I think you'll see more Googles in the energy sector, and this is what uh, Silicon Valley has actually uh, expected all along in the, next coming, in the coming years when the, re, the uh, economy recovers. The next major technology is concentrating solar thermal, and it has various names, uh, solar thermal electricity, concentrated solar power, but I'll follow the current Australian nomenclature in calling it concentrating solar thermal, or CST. We'll just call it that for this meeting and, and hope nobody's confused. Um, in short, CST involves using reflectors uh, to produce uh, temperatures high enough to raise steam uh, for a conventional steam turbine, and then from that point on, it's just a conventional system. Uh, also, it can provide temperatures high enough for high temperature thermodynamic cycles, uh, such as the Brayton cycle used in uh, jet engines. Um, but basically, it, it uses mirrors without the smoke, if you can think of that way. The major types of CST are parabolic trough, central receiver, or power tower, some know it, uh, the paraboloidal dish, sometimes called the parabolic dish, and the linear Fresnel reflector system. Uh, it's a crazy period. Um, I was sitting on a panel a couple of weeks ago in Berlin, and uh, there were six of us, uh, and they were all startups, and they all had radically different technology uh, addressing the same market. So we're at the period uh, just like in the early 1900s when the cars were all different designs and the planes were all different designs and everybody's trying them out in the marketplace to see, see what goes. It doesn't mean these designs are wrong in any way. Some, of these, um, some will be a little better than others, but, uh, or they may end up occupying different market niches. But um, it, is a, it is an amazing time to see uh, everybody working in all these different ways. Um, after enjoying subsidies in the early 80s, uh, uh, some parabolic troughs had been installed in uh, the United States, but uh, the subsidies disappeared in the 1990s as governments took uh, yet another wrong-term policy. Um, now the Spanish feed-in laws are active again, and, uh, or active, and U.S. subsidies are back. Um, so we're starting to get very, very rapid growth, as I'll show, I'll show you a little later. Australia is also proposing assistance to large projects under the flagship program, uh, but we've yet to see really good detail on that. Uh, only 600 megawatts is operating so far, and uh, about 400 megawatts is currently under construction. That seems small, but in fact, um, the plants take a long time to uh, develop as projects, and um, after a, a bit of a discussion at the last conference I was at in Berlin, uh, it was decided that about 14,000 megawatts is currently under development uh, in the field. 
Uh, nominally, it's 22,000 megawatts, but we think the others are, are, are a bit iffy. Um, this, this is, this is uh, coming up extremely rapidly and shows that uh, uh, solar thermal is entering the inflection that both uh, and, and going up strongly uh, that wind did uh, 20 years ago and PV uh, did in the middle of this uh, decade. Parabolic troughs, uh, if we can go into the different types, and uh, I, I apologize for this, but they, they are so different that, uh, that either I gloss over the whole lot of them and just say that they're uh, CST, or we have to go into them some, to some extent and explain. Parabolic troughs are made of uh, long rows of bent glass that uh, have a focus, and uh, they illuminate that, uh, they put tubes in that focal line, and uh, the oil heats up uh, when illuminated. Uh, the heat is circulated through a heat exchanger. Uh, there's water on the other side of the heat exchanger, which boils, so that produces steam, and it runs a conventional steam turbine. Now, Leonardo da Vinci actually was the first known to consider solar troughs for a commercial purpose. Uh, as usual, he was first. And uh, uh, this was for a dye works. He wanted to produce uh, heat for a dye works, or quite hot water for a dye works. Um, the first demonstrations of small parabolic troughs were by Augustine Mouchot in France in the 1860s and John Erickson in the U.S. in 1870s. John Erickson is also famous for designing uh, the Erickson cycle, which is the thermodynamic cycle, uh, different engines, and also the uh, monitor gunboat, which fought it out in the Civil War with the Merrimack. The first practical system was Frank Schumann's uh, trough system. Uh, that's a picture of it there. Uh, uh, it went in in approximately uh, 1911 in, in Egypt, and it was used for pumping. There was no electricity produced by it, but it could have because it was running a pump uh, with a, 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 a actually sub-atmospheric thermodynamic cycle if there are any engineers here. Um, however, the war intervened. Uh, all the workers went back to their various countries because it was an international team. Some went to Germany, some went to, uh, back to Britain and so forth, and they fought, fought each other in the trenches. And Schumann died in 1916. Uh, then the interest fell away f uh, right until the seven, uh, past the oil shock uh, of 73 uh, uh, when Acurex, a company in the United States, um, developed uh, quite an advanced parabolic trough for heat production. After seeing the Acurex design, a similar system was adopted by the Luz company in Israel in the early 80s, and um, uh, they added a heat exchanger and, uh, to, to take the heat from the oil in the system and a turbine for electricity production. Uh, Luz has successfully produced 354 megawatts of solar capacity in California in the 1980s, and these, for a long time, solar thermal was the biggest solar electricity in the world, for a long time, uh, almost to the year 2000, as a result of that. Um, but the energy politics of the Reagan and the Bush uh, governments in this period were strongly linked to the nuclear and coal lobbies, and uh, there was uh, a little bit of unfortunate action. The federal government sued the Luz uh, uh, company uh, uh, in, in terms of a subsidy payment, uh, whether they were making these subsidy payments or not. Luz actually won the case, but uh, the case cost so much that they entered bankruptcy and didn't, didn't survive. Uh, the loose plants, however, are owned by investors. They always were, and uh, they still exist. And they continue to operate to this day, and uh, they perform much better now than they did when they were installed. Uh, because um, one thing people don't realize about solar plants is that they're like the thousand-year-old axe. Uh, a mirror breaks, you put in a better mirror. Um, a tube breaks, you put in the newest quality tube, and you keep on improving the, the design. And um, as long as the basic structure of the uh, plant is there, the plant could last uh, 50 to 100 years, uh, so long as you can continue to get the same sort of components. Tower plants uh, are different. Oh, by the way, those plants um, actually operate during the air conditioning peak really well, and uh, California utilities love them, by the way. They, they don't want to tear them down. Um, tower plants use two-axis tracking mirrors called heliostats to focus light uh, on a boiler and receiver at the top of a tower, which is generally uh, 100 or 200 meters high. Um, heliostats go back a long way. I'm, I'm actually working with someone in Italy to try to figure out just where they started. Um, we're, we're, we're not quite sure, um, but we do know for sure that a man called Buffon in the 1700s, um, 1714, George Buffon in France uh, demonstrated to the King of France that uh, an array of heliostats such as you see, which were hand-cranked by uh, uh, diligent workers, uh, could set fire to wood on a ship 200 feet away. 
Uh, this was to illustrate the ancient tale of Archimedes setting fire to the sails of the Roman fleet at Syracuse uh, using thousands of polished shields. And so he wanted to show that that was possible. And, uh, and the king was very impressed. Uh, we don't actually know if that ever occurred. There's a, lo a lot of debate about that. But it, as an aside, um, there has been a new uh, complete text of Archimedes recently discovered. Uh, it was underneath uh, monastic writing in a monastery. And uh, they're using uh, imaging techniques, uh, X-ray type image techniques, to work out the entire text. And the text should be available at the end of this year. So it's the first new, it's the first text of Archimedes Direct that uh, was ever discovered. So we might find out if he was involved in solar energy to any extent. The first modern um, power tower was built in France by a man, a uh, true pioneer called Giovanni Francia. Uh, and uh, this led directly to larger prototypes in Italy, France, and the United States, where he was involved in the, uh, the actual transfer of the technology. Storage experiments were conducted using molten salt in the United States in the 1990s until funding ran out from the DOE. Uh, it was cut off rather abruptly. And uh, a 10 megawatt power plant uh, was installed in Spain by Abengoa in 2007. That's a picture of it there. Uh, they're getting a bit artistic, uh, as you can see, or uh, appreciating the possible beauty of those. So there are stairways on either side, and you can go up. I've been up the tower, so, um, uh, but it, you, you have to dodge a bit if the beam's on, I can tell you. Um, and a, a, a larger version of this, a 20 megawatt uh, sister, sister plant, was just installed uh, on grid uh, next to it. So both, both are there in Spain. Several other designs exist, including a, a bright source design, which nobody quite knows about because they're keeping uh, very close closed about it, but it's obtained se several gigawatts of hour in power purchase agreements from California utilities, and uh, that uses backup gas fuel. Um, eSolar is another company. Uh, the, these, they're very flashy, and uh, uh, what they do is manufacture their plants in China, uh, and they have tiny little mirrors, which are only one square meter, and each, each has two actuators uh, for moving in all directions. And uh, so if you have 500,000 square meters, you have a million actuators. And so the computing power required to operate this is actually quite substantial, and that's why it's kind of e-solar. Uh, we, we're, we're going to use uh, the electronic age to power these things. Of course, uh, I, uh, I don't think it was originally uh, envisaged that you use them for advertising, but that, that, that seems to be also possible. <laughs> Um, there are many other designs going on right now. Uh, there are also designs called salt towers, uh, which uh, in in incorporate uh, molten salt and circulate the salt through the tower into a storage unit. And, uh, don't, uh, and the salt goes through a heat exchange, uh, conducts its heat through a heat exchanger into water to boil, uh, to boil steam again. Um, a, a salt tower is under construction in Spain right now and will be ready in 2011 and uh, uh, basically offers solar base load night and day. So uh, the, this is a very important development. The third kind of uh, CST technology is the paraboloidal dish, which is rather like a large satellite dish, uh, but made from glass mirrors, as most uh, uh, CST is. There are two main types. The Stirling Energy System uh, is a dish, uh, which you can see there. It's now called the Sun Catcher, and they've renamed themselves Tessera Solar. Um, uh, uh, with a Stirling Cycle engine at the focus. Uh, they've had a lot of delay in that program. It, it came from the uh, early, early part of the last uh, of this decade and uh, was delayed many years, but they had recent investment from a, a, a company uh, in Ireland called NTR. That's provided the capital they need to uh, change their engine, which is now produced in Japan instead of elsewhere, and, and um, uh, make a lot of improvements. So uh, they now are going to start uh, a construction of very large plants, about 1,750 megawatts of plants next year. Um, so again, uh, another new technology coming out. Another dish is, is a bit different. Uh, that's the ANU dish, uh, but now is uh, licensed to Wizard Power. In, in Australia, that's an Australian invention. Um, uh, Keith Lovegrove, who works on this, uh, it, we used to have the big dish, which was 400 square meters. Um, this one he calls the little bit larger dish because it's 500 square meters. And uh, these are intended to be installed in large arrays and produce steam, uh, linked, linked up and to produce steam at a high temperature. But they can also operate the ammonia storage system that's been developed by ANU over about 20 years. And so four dishes are going to be set up near Wyala. Uh, in South Australia and to operate uh, an ammonia storage system and see if that actually uh, works as planned. And that's funded under the Greenhouse Office um, program. 
The fourth uh, CST technology is called linear Fresnel technology. We had a lot to do with this one. But uh, the origin, the origin uh, it's a linear system and with uh, long rows of mirrors, um, uh, which focus radiation on a, a long horizontal series of absorber pipes suspended high above the ground. It's kind of an analog to the parabolic trough unit. It's a linear system, but um, it, it has many advantages. It's much easier to construct. The mirrors are nearly flat. Uh, ooh. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> Uh, the mirrors are nearly flat, and um, uh, the plumbing is fixed. So a parabolic trough has to move around its pipes as it, as it tracks the sun, uh, keeping, keeping it in focus. Uh, this this uh, has the mirrors individually aiming upward at a fixed plumbing uh, setup, and that means you can go to very high pressures and high temperatures potentially. So not only is it cheaper, but it may be able to be more efficient uh, than, than the present system. So uh, these are in their adolescence, but uh, that's, that's basically our, our fundamental product inside our company, and uh, we've built uh, already two different types. Um, we uh, built a prototype in uh, 2004, Macquarie Generation and Liddell, uh, so that was the first uh, prototype of this type in, uh, uh, where we're, we're generating steam for a commercial uh, purpose. Uh, this one you see up, up at the moment <clears throat> is a bit similar, but you notice the tower is different. It's an A-frame tower. It's meant to be in California. It's actually on the fault line, and uh, uh, it's meant to stand up in an earthquake as, as well as a high wind. So uh, the, the, te the technology is getting very, very robust. The Australian plant was the first, world's first solar supplementation of a conventional plant, a coal plant, providing energy to an existing plant to reduce the amount of uh, fossil fuel going into it. And we identified that as a, uh, a, a short-term market where uh, we could start to build solar collectors to good environmental effect um, uh, and uh, uh, build up the industry while we're waiting for turbines to be delivered, which can take three or four years. So I think this, the CST market as a, as a whole should really take off in about uh, 2015, about 10 years after PV. Uh, still, the, the plants are big and complicated. You might well ask, well, why should we bother? Um, uh, if we can get solar energy from PV with no moving parts. CST has a trump card. Energy can be stored by them in heat because there's an intermediate uh, part of this process. We, it's, uh, the, the, energies, the solar energy, the photons are collected as heat first, not directly collected, collected, uh, turned into electricity as in wind generators and, and photovoltaics. You can hold and store heat much more cheaply than you can uh, electricity in batteries. And this means that uh, it's possible to generate the heat, hold it, and then uh, wait till later in the evening uh, when there's a peak or, or hold it overnight and then uh, let that heat out and that would boil water and run, run through a turbine. It also means that the turbine that you would have uh, in, for a daytime only plant, which might have to take all of the energy in about eight hours, uh, can now take all that energy in a much longer time, maybe 16 hours or, or maybe even 24 hours. And uh, that means the turbine itself can be smaller because it's t taking the same amount of energy and spinning it out over a longer period of time. So you save money that way. So um, uh, it it's, uh, depends on the cost of the storage, but it's quite possible to have storage go in and the uh, kilowatt hour cost go down. And uh, I, I believe there are now about 20 projects around the world for advanced storage. Um, uh, uh, quite a few of these are aiming at targets which, in which uh, the cost of kilo, per kilowatt hour would go down if you installed storage, and therefore, you, the, why would you ever not put in storage at, at that point? So storage becomes the standard unit, and, it, and that is a big differentiator from, say, wind or PV, which has uh, no storage yet. Uh, of course, you can put batteries on it, but it would be mighty expensive if you did that. I did some calculations uh, 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 a couple of years ago, uh, while at OSRA, and uh, some prior calculations before I left Australia for uh, the Australian market. And, um, uh, well, actually, uh, there, there, there is a picture up uh, for those who can't see it. Um, there are some big tanks in the foreground. Uh, I should describe what that is. That's the world's first uh, storage solar plant, which has been running a year in Spain using molten salt storage and parabolic trough. Um, uh, it is a, a full peaking plant. It's able to operate for 24 hours and uh, wind down at night and come up in the daytime. So it's what we call a load-following plant. 
Um, uh, that is the future in this field. Uh, you may not use the same storage. You may use other modes of storage. You may use other modes of collector. But the general field is going to go this way, and it has profound consequences for the existing technology because for the first time you don't have to hope that someone will back up your collector system or your wind system if uh, it happens to go down and uh, maybe there's a coal plant out there or a gas plant that will back you up. You can actually replace uh, the, 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 whole, the whole plant and the whole process. Uh, so uh, the, these are very important developments, and they're all going on almost simultaneously at the, uh, as, as we speak. Um, in, this, in this study that I was referring to, we uh, looked at California, and we got the load data for 2006 for, uh, and, uh, for, for one hour intervals. That means how many kilowatt hours the state was using for the whole year. And then we modeled a solar collector uh, on an hourly basis and uh, made it the same size as the maximum uh, uh, amount of peak electricity produced by the California system, which was 50 gigawatts, 50,000 megawatts. And what happened when we did that uh, was we could vary the storage in the, in, the, in the model system. When we came out with 16-hour storage, we had uh, covered 93% of the uh, state's electricity load in the model. And that was a very shocking uh, outcome.